Who's our next guest? We got no one. We need a new format. We should shut down and retool. What about a guest host? I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Hi there, and welcome to Baseball by Design. I am not minor league baseball correspondent for sportslogos.net, Paul Caputo, nor am I broadcasting live from the Helmet Sunday Hall of Fame in Paul's basement in Fort Collins, Colorado. Rather, I am sports branding professional and friend of the Baseball by Design podcast, Dan Simon, broadcasting live from the Studio Simon headquarters in the former terminal building at Bowman Field, the state of Kentucky's oldest civil airport in Louisville, Kentucky. Today, we bring you, the Baseball by Design podcast listeners, a special Turn the Tables interview in which I play host and interview Paul. Because, well, what do we really know about this guy beyond the fact that he collects baseball Sunday helmets and likes to wear dad hats? Uh, so right now, I'm very pleased to be joined by my very special guest, Paul Caputo. Paul, welcome to my Turn the Tables takeover of your Baseball by Design podcast. And thank you so much for relinquishing the reins and for being here. Dan, thank you so much for inviting me on my own podcast. I really appreciate it. What a what a special moment for me, and I appreciate you uh, asking me to come talk about myself. There's nothing I like to talk about more. Okay, let's get started with something that is uh, very important to me. It's a matter of syntax. For people who don't necessarily know what that word means, um, it's simply the correct arrangement of words. Uh, I used to go to the uh, I, I went to school at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, and I remember there being graffiti in the in the bathroom that said, sucks syntax, <laughs> meaning, which I thought was pretty funny because that's not the correct arrangement of words. It should be syntax sucks. <laughs> so I have, I have always wondered this about you. You refer to where you record your podcast as the Helmet Sunday Hall of Fame, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, when you go to a ballpark or anywhere else and you get a Sunday in a baseball helmet, it is indeed a helmet Sunday. Yeah. What you have in your <laughs> Hall of Fame are the helmets minus the Sundays. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that, so they're no longer, are they still helmet Sundays or, or should they be Sunday helmets? You've, you've challenged me to think about something here that I haven't really thought about before in, in that way, right? Like, I, I think you're right. I think they're Sunday helmets. And I think that uh, the colloquial use of helmet Sundays has just reached a point where that's, you know, that's that's what I refer to them as without, without I, I refer to them that way unthinkingly, I think. I think you're probably right. You know, if we're being strictly logical about it, I think probably they are Sunday helmets. Now, do you... You know, th this might be when I work with teams, one of the big considerations, if they're not if it's not a new team coming to a new town, but basically a team that's either doing a brand update or a rebrand is in addition to the fees that I charge. What is this going to cost them? Uh, perfect example. Years ago, when I was doing a brand update for the Rancho Cucamonica Quakes, uh, the first round presentation we did had basically a, a whole new look, even though they were keeping the, the the name of the team. But what happened was the GM at the time was this guy named North Johnson, who mm -hmm. uh, an, an industry veteran. And he said, you know what? After looking at what you guys did, we realized if we're going to change everything, this is going to cost us a lot of money. We have on our scoreboard these big letters that say that says quakes and around it are these lights that when somebody hits a home run uh these lights kind of like dance around the letters and replacing that's going to be like a hundred thousand dollars so we're going to let when we do this brand update this is north talking to me let's let's use the existing lettering and build some new stuff around that so that we don't have to replace that that lighted thing on this uh, on the scoreboard so this begs the question do you have any permanent signage at the what is now referred to as the Helmet Sunday Hall of Fame that would need to be changed to change that to the Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame? So we do need some signage down there. I have the closest thing I have to signage indicating that there's anything to do with minor league baseball down there 
is a little wooden sign that I bought from the Kannapolis Cannonballers that just had their logo on it. And they just, I, it was an impulse buy. They posted it on Twitter and it, it had the outline of the state of North Carolina. And I just thought it was a cool sign. As you know, we've talked about this before. I love that Kannapolis Cannonballers logo. And in fact, if I had not just gone for a run right before this podcast, I was going to wear my new Kannapolis Cannonballers Hawaiian shirt for this podcast. Uh, but I'm too sweaty to wear it uh, because I just got back from a run that took a little longer than I thought it was going to. So uh, I don't have any signage that says Helmet Sunday or Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame for the actual are we calling it the Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame? Are we making that 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 change right now, Dan, right here live on the podcast? Well, this will be think about what a major event that would be. And <laughs> and this this is a podcast that would go down and in for me because of this important thing that took place at uh during this this interview. So um, you know what? That's gonna have to I think you're gonna have to take that to the um to the your board um and have a vote on it and i don't know how many people sit on that board but i'm sure it's probably at least a dozen of your most influential movers and shakers and it's it's actually the board of directors of the sunday helmet hall of fame is the uh the entirety of uh 4500 twitter followers right now so that's okay uh, well maybe we put that up for a vote then to uh, put okay. that out there on twitter keep it helmet sunday hall of fame or change it to sunday helmet hall of fame we'll leave it up to them uh, and I'm interested to see what happens. This is a, a fascinating um, turn of events in museum history. So, um, okay, now that we got that that taken care of, that's probably the most important thing we'll discuss this, this whole- uh, I think podcast. that's probably it, yeah. Okay, let's go back to the beginning, Paul. Um, where were you born and where did you grow up? It's not necessarily the same. I was born in the Bronx, never lived there. I lived in Queens, both New York City, but two different boroughs. So um, did you, were you, where were you born? And is that the same place where you lived the first however many years of your life? So I was born in Lankanaw Hospital in Philadelphia. And I spent the first 18 years of my life in the Philadelphia area. Uh, I grew up in, I, well, the first seven years of my life, I lived in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. I've got some great pictures of me wearing like a, like a Greg Luzinski t-shirt. I have to mention my brother is like a, a super successful fancy lawyer. And, you know, and I'm, I'm the graphic designer who works for a nonprofit association, right? So uh, we have a great photo of my brother, khaki shorts, tucked in Mike Schmidt t-shirt. And me with like scruffy pants, shirts untucked, the shirt's dirty. It's like a little bit ripped and it's Greg Luzinski. And so it's my brother and me standing next to each other in front of our house in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. Dave all buttoned up and tidy with his Mike Schmidt, his clean Mike Schmidt t-shirt and me all scruffy with my, my ragtag Greg Luzinski t-shirt. And so that was, that's the image I have of, of the first seven years of my life in Drexel Hill. And then we moved to uh, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Uh, where uh, I lived until I left for college, and my my parents still live in Wayne, Pennsylvania, near the King of Prussia Mall. My brother lives in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, with his family, and my sister lives in uh, St. David's, which is right near Villanova in Pennsylvania. So I'm the black sheep. I left and and went to Colorado, but the rest of my family is still back there in the Philadelphia area. Okay, but you remain a um, you you were a Phillies fan then. You mentioned Greg Luzinski with mm -hmm. your shirt and Mike Schmidt with your brother's shirt. Um, and you've you've talked on the podcast about well the Phillies and their run to the World Series this year, and you got yeah. to go to your first World Series game, which ended up being wow, what a game that was. That um, was great. You mentioned wearing a Greg Luzinski shirt, but your brother was wearing a Mike Schmidt shirt. Mm -hmm. Who was your favorite player? My favorite player growing up. And there's no real explanation for this, except for maybe it's because he played the position that I played in Little League. I loved watching Manny Trio play. He had this amazing, like, errorless streak going for, for much of my childhood. I remember the day he finally made an error, and it was just such a, a sad moment. But Manny Trio, for for many years as a kid, was was my favorite player. Loved watching him play. Wizard at second base. He was indeed a good second baseman. I remember him well, and one of the things that I – immediately associate with him was his sidearm kind of whip like way he threw yeah great yeah. Well, it was so much fun growing up going to the vet and watching watching manny trio play second base i mean i also got to watch the greatest third baseman ever play the game uh with mike schmidt at the hot corner over there but you know that 
having having uh, Manny Trio at second base was always something I just I loved watching. Well, you just you just mentioned that you and Manny uh, shared a position. Well, you didn't share it as you didn't play it at the same time on the same field, but you blocked my path to the majors, I think. Uh, So um, Little League Baseball. Yeah. uh, With with what you discuss here on the podcast and what I do for a living, uh, the names of the team are a big deal. Yeah. Um, I have worked with teams helping helping them name coming up with. Uh, concepts for for new names for for some of the teams with which I've worked. Um, obviously, I've worked with a lot of teams who already had names, and you a good name helps lead to a good identity. When I played Little League, uh, when I played Little League, we were not named. Our teams were not named either after minor league or major league teams. We were named. The, the first team I played on was New Jersey Bank. I also played on Mac Wayne Plastics. We were named after our sponsors. Other 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 names of teams in I remember playing against was were Gem Car Wash, Vincent's Jewelers, and one of my all time favorites, Aldon Meat Market. Wow! Uh, so yeah. when you played Little League, were your teams named after your sponsors, or were your team like like the Bad News Bears played for Chico's Bail? Well, they were. They were named the Bears, but big on the back of their jersey were, was Chico's Bail Bonds. Um, what were your teams named? And and do you remember the name of the? Well, let let's hear the answer to that one first, and then well, I'll have a follow up question. First, first, I just want to say that you 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 throw out the records when Vincent's Jewelers and Aldon's Meat Markets meet on the <laughs> field right there. That 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 rivalry is just a great one. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit embarrassed to say this, Dan, but the team that I played for for like seven years. In, in Little League was the Mets. They just randomly assigned us teams and we were the Mets. And I think we had like like those sort of classic like 80s like ringer tees. It was a yellow shirt with a white ringer and it just said Mets in block capital letters, sans serif, all caps. And then we just had a yellow hat. It was a, like a yellow trucker hat basically. Uh, yeah, so we were just the Mets and it was, it fe- even then, it kind of felt dirty, right? Like being, being, <laughs> being a Met in Little League. We did not have, oddly, we did not have a Phillies growing up. And I think it was because everyone would have wanted to be the Philly. And so we had, uh, you know, we had, we had just a bunch of sort of random teams and one of them was the Mets. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting because your, your podcast is all about the, the design and well, not, it's not all about the design, but certainly the design is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And, so here, in the first chance, you get to wear a quote-unquote uniform, even though it was just a, a, a ringer tee. Yeah. Uh, not only did they not have the actual Met script, they just mm-hmm. had a block block generic lettering, it yeah. sounds like, and then a yellow hat, which is <laughs> not associated with the Mets. Obviously, their colors no. are royal blue and orange. And yeah. then, you know, in the whatever 90s, they brought in black. Um, but you didn't even get to... Um, uh enjoy wearing the the major league teams quote unquote uniform emblazoned with their with their real look and the right. real hand. we didn't we certainly didn't have the the naming conventions that they have now in little league with you know these licensing agreements that they have with with minor league teams right like i would i would love to have grown up playing on an on an iron pigs or a tortugas or, you know, or, or a, even like a Durham bulls, right? Like if we could have licensed out some minor league gear, but yeah, my, my, my love for branding certainly did not begin with little league. Well, that brings me to an interesting question, which is where did your love for branding come from? I was a, I was a French major in college, journalism minor, Got into graphic design by learning Quark Express so that I could be an editor on the University of Richmond. The Collegian is what our newspaper was called uh, at the University of Richmond. And it was, uh, you know, I, I basically had to learn Quark Express in order to be the section editor, the, the opinion section editor for the Collegian. And that was something I was interested in as a journalism student. And so I got into um, my, my, my avenue into graphic design was through page layout. I, I knew when I looked at something, when I liked something, and I knew when I didn't like it. Like I knew what looked good, and I knew what didn't look good. And 
I couldn't articulate why certain things looked good and certain things did not. And because I couldn't articulate it, I knew that I didn't understand it well enough to create those things myself. And so I eventually went back to school, got a, a Master of Fine Arts in Visual Communications from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Logo design in particular has always felt a little bit like wizardry to me because with many styles of graphic design, with many avenues of graphic design, you can almost explain it into being appreciated. You can explain like, okay, here's how the grid system works. Here's how the hierarchy works. Here's how the, you know, the certain rules work. You can explain to a client, like, this is why I did the things that I did and hope that they understand it and appreciate it and, and, you know, accept your expertise on the, on the subject. With logo design, I think more than any other aspect of graphic design, logo design feels to me like, you can present it to a client, you can have followed all of the rules, you can have done everything perfectly and created this technically correct, beautiful logo that 99 people out of 100 are going to love. And if your client looks at it and goes, eh, then it's back to the drawing board, right? And so logo design feels like a, a wizardry because I can't do it. And B, it, it's, it seems incredibly frustrating to me because you can be the most talented professional in the world and if you create something that for whatever reason you present to a client on the on they're having a bad day or it just doesn't strike them a certain way, they can just sort of shrug and there's nothing you can do with it because you can't go back and like make it better technically, right? Like so so anyway, so when I started writing about sports branding, it really was the it, it was on a lot of different levels. One of them was that for minor league baseball, I loved the connection to the local communities. I loved the stories that these nicknames tell. And so when I actually wrote the book that I wrote, it was called The Story Behind the Nickname because what I was talking about was the nicknames. It wasn't necessarily the logos themselves. And then of course, you know, with a background in graphic design and speaking and starting to speak with the designers about the logos, it was it became clear to me that, you know, the the logos were, you know, a, as big if not a bigger part of the story than the nicknames themselves. And obviously they they have to work together. But the appreciation for, for the brands, for the logos, came from just being a baseball fan, appreciating the logos aesthetically, and then appreciating the, the stories that these minor league names in particular tell about the, the local place. There's no real, ex except for the fact that my background was in graphic design, there's no real one place where I can point to and say, this is how I started loving logos. Well, do you remember which came first? Did you have a love for logos? And that was the impetus to get you to go to a minor league game or games, or did you go to a minor league game, see these logos, and that's where the that where was the genesis of that love of minor league logos? It was that right. Like there's there's an emotional sort of there, there's the brand equity is strong with me, <laughs> right? Like the the going to a game, having a positive experience, having nostalgia for going to these places started me on a path of appreciating the logos, right? The the baseball Palooza road trip that I take with my college buddies, you know, the this sort of nostalgia that I have for going to these games, I think is what started me on it. And in fact, I used to have a sort of hard and fast rule that I wouldn't get a hat or a t-shirt from a team that I had not seen in person. You know, that these these caps and these t-shirts were souvenirs from having visited games. And the 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 love for the logos and the appreciation for for the design sort of overtook that right like and and that became its own thing and so you know we talked about the cannonballers i have a bunch of cannonballer stuff i have a bunch of daytona tortuga stuff i've never been to either of their ballparks i have you know obviously i have savannah banana stuff i've never seen the bananas play uh you know these are all just logos that i appreciate because they're fun and they tell stories and and so, so now I think it started with going to the games and, you know, having these souvenirs because they were achieving the effect of being souvenirs. Uh, but I think the, the appreciation for the logos and the design um, overtook that. Okay. So do you remember then what the first minor league game you ever attended was? I, I know in, in the area you, you live, lived uh, in Pennsylvania there are a number of minor league teams around there. I'm not necessarily sure based on 
how old you were and when they started, if they were there when you were a child. But did you go to did you go to a game as as a young child? Did that happen later? Teenager, young adult? It do happened. You remember the first minor league game. I do. It happened much later in my lifetime, actually. Then uh, this is. I think this is going to be surprising to folks. Um, the first minor league game that I went to was the Richmond Braves when I was in college. And, okay. uh, and I remember feeling a little dirty about it, right. You know, going and watching a, a Braves team play, but it was the Richmond Braves. And then in 1994, when major league baseball went on strike, the independent Camden river sharks just across the river from Philadelphia were, were still playing. And so instead of going to a Phillies game, we we would we went across the river and went to a Camden River Sharks game. I for for many 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 years the only baseball stadium that I went to was Veteran Stadium. I had never been anywhere outside of Veteran Stadium, and it's sort of I mean it's sort of interesting to think about, right? Like for the first I don't know sixteen years of my life, the you know every every vacation was to my grandmother's house at the Jersey Shore. Every baseball game was Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia. And every Friday night was either Pizza Hut or Bennigan's. And that was sort of our fun thing, right? Like, and my, you know, my parents were, uh, you know, they, we were, we were solidly entrenched in the middle class. And it was, there was very little travel, even like, you know, the idea of like driving to Reading for a Reading Phillies game, you know, like even that was, you know, it was a couple hours away and it just sort of never occurred to us. It was like, when we wanted to go to baseball, we went to the vet. And then I remember when I got to college and I had friends who were who were baseball fans. Some of my friends who are still part of the baseball Palooza road trip, you know, we 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 would drive, we would see games in Richmond. This was before the Nationals existed, right? So we would we would see games in Richmond. We would drive up to Baltimore. I remember going to a, a game right after Camden Yards opened in Baltimore and thinking like, oh my god, like, <laughs> like what an experience! This is an incredible experience. And that was, um, you know, that that really started me on a path of. Uh, I remember, I remember looking for, you know, even way back then, something I didn't do until this past summer. I remember looking for like, what's the first, what's a, what's a way we could go to two games at two stadiums in one day. And, uh, you know, we were looking at Richmond and Baltimore and Philadelphia sort of as, as possibilities. We never really did explore the minors outside of Richmond. Uh, and then in 1994, the, I took my first baseball road trip which was four of us, including me, drove overnight for spring break. We drove overnight down to Florida, and then we went down the east coast of Florida and then up the west coast, seeing baseball every day. And uh, I remember the, the the two signature things there were going to a Dodgers game in Vero Beach and going to Sarasota to see the White Sox play, which was unremarkable in every possible way. I mean, except for that it was spring training baseball, and it was amazing. Uh, but it was it was... Um, Michael Jordan was on that White Sox team. That was 1994. And uh, Michael Jordan was there and he came out and caught, he caught warmups uh, between innings and he was on deck as a pinch hitter when the game ended. And that's how, that's how close I came to seeing Michael Jordan play baseball. Well, Paul, we've already uh, determined that you and I have a lot in common uh -huh. and hearing what you were just talking about the, um, you, your very first baseball road trip, and you've been on many since with your baseball palooza trips with oh, yeah. your buddies. Um, my very first baseball road trip was also in 1994, and that was a minor league baseball road trip on which, coincidentally, I got to see Michael Jordan play in Birmingham. So uh, really, <laughs> yeah. So we, you just missed him. I, I got to see him, and his you manager was, play. was Terry Francona, who we all know very well now. Of course. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, by the way, one of the things that I I was hoping we would get in this podcast is is to get to know you beyond what has already come out about you in, in, in your podcast. Well, you're talking with other people. It's less about Paul, more about them. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that we've already gotten into things like Pizza Hut and Bennigan's, you know, <laughs> we've already accomplished what, what I want to accomplish, things <laughs> you, that would have never come up about you. So that that was those were special nights in the Caputo household was were, were Pizza Hut and, and Bennigan's. So uh, you, you mentioned... Um, uh, we, Baseball, every every time we're talking about things you're doing, now, granted, this is a, a baseball by design podcast. You're not talking about 
hockey, football, basketball, mm-hmm. other sports. Uh, were you growing up a, 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 an all sports nut or was your love primarily for or completely for baseball? Baseball was definitely the 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 first love. It was my favorite sport. It was the one we went to in person the most. Uh, in fact, almost exclusively. Very rarely went to see the Eagles, uh, the Sixers, or the Flyers play. I went to, you know, maybe over the course of my childhood, like one or two of those, almost always like with friends who would invite me. Uh, that being said, one of my favorite things about being a sports fan is the community, right? It's one of the reasons that I have stayed a Phillies fan is because the 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 people who you grow up with, the people who, you know, you you, you know, the first people you're going to text when the Phillies win a World Series game, you know, that sort of thing. It's to me the the sports fandom is is all about being sort of part of this larger community and um, you know, so so like even now, like if the Flyers are doing well or if the Sixers are doing well, I probably couldn't name three players on either of those teams. But I could, you know, I really appreciate the fact that like friends and family are, you know, reveling in the fact that these teams are winning. So, you know, obviously my 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 sports fandom is really firmly entrenched in in baseball, but I really love being a Philadelphia sports fan just because as we saw in the World Series, Dan, I think you saw it. Philadelphia sports fans are pretty much the best sports fans. There, there's no question that it's hard to top the passion you saw from those fans. Not just saw, heard from those fans. Yeah. <laughs> um, during those games, you know, I, I even remember the the commentators and the the broadcasts talking specifically about that. They and they were all excited to go there just because the the atmosphere. You know, these are people who've been. These broadcasters are people who've been to and broadcast at numerous games, if probably thousands of games in their careers, um, including big games, postseason, World Series, All-Star games, whatever, and exciting games. And they were excited to go to Philadelphia just because of how passionate those fans were and, and how that just it was the that palpable feeling of, of excitement, of love. Mm-hmm. Of, whatever there there's a, a whole bunch of words you can you can attach to it yeah. um it really seems like a, a unique atmosphere or if not unique take the atmosphere that we're familiar with at big time sporting events and then you know turn it up to 11 as uh, as, <laughs> as they say right. uh, being at that game i was there with my my father 5 days after well it ended up being 6 days because of the rain out uh 6 days after my father's 82nd birthday. And so we got to sit out there in right field and, and watch that happen, you know, live. It was my first ever world series game. He's been to a world series game with my brother before, but it, the, it was, it was the most exciting sports moment you can think of times 10 for me, right? It was just, I couldn't, I've never been at a sporting event where I literally didn't know what to do with my body. (laughs) Like, you know, Bryce Harper's first inning home run. I just like, you, you you know they pan these crowds and you see it's just this sea of humanity with arms just flailing everywhere and people hugging and smacking each other and you know shoving and pushing it's like it's like a big mosh pit or something right because just people don't know what to do with with their bodies right and so it was uh it that that experience was as as incredible as you could imagine right and i'm super glad i didn't go the next night when they got no hit <laughs> you well, know, okay? yeah that's exactly the thing it, the 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 luck of, or or luck, or maybe was it fate that yeah. the game, you know, you had, what, three games from which, am I remembering correctly, it started in the American League, two games mm-hmm. and three in Philly. Yeah. Okay, so there were three games you could have gone to or mm-hmm. could have tried to get tickets to. And the one you went to was one of the most memorable games in, in postseason history. Certainly uh, for Phillies fans, yes. Yeah, certainly for Phillies fans. So... Um, yeah, that was, um, I remember watching that game, knowing you were there thinking, <laughs> boy, that, I'm, I'm so happy for Paul. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Well, <laughs> you're welcome. I was, I was, <laughs> I was actively thinking about you being there. So, uh, bringing this back to, to what your podcast is all about, uh, sports brand identities. Um, w- I remember Speaking of our first uh, baseball road trips in in 1994, 
back around that time, I remember getting this catalog in the mail for a company called Starstruck. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Okay, it was a it was a sports apparel catalog, and I remember seeing in that catalog for the first time minor league identities. Keep in mind, this is if it's not before the internet, it's at least in the when the internet was in its infancy and and things were not as ubiquitous as they are today where mm -hmm. you can see anything around the world that you wouldn't have necessarily seen before were it not for, for the internet and social media and things like that. And I remember seeing the, the Madison Muskies, mm -hmm. the Billings Mustangs, I, they had those caps as well as other caps, but for whatever reason, those two kind of stand out to me. Um, seeing those, and there, there were nothing like any Major League Baseball cap I, I had ever seen. And they, 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 that really resonated with me. I remember thinking, this is something different. I like this. Do you remember what was the first minor league baseball identity you remember seeing and thinking, this is different. This is cool. Yes. I, and, and, you know, the, the easy answer is going to be the Doran Bowles. My brother went to school at Duke. I remember visiting him there in 1991, right around the time that movie came out, right? So I remember... It's almost too easy an answer, but the the Durham Bulls were were definitely one where because of the movie, because of visiting my brother, you know, down there in Durham, thinking, okay, this is you know this is really cool, like a brand, a baseball brand that is not a a, a major league baseball brand that is kind of a fun one. That was the first sort of awareness that like minor league brands might be kind of a cool, fun thing, and another and sort of another. Uh, funny one and one that you have since done some work on, but the Toledo Mud Hens. Obviously, I was a, a fan of the TV show MASH and, you know, that, you know, seeing Klinger be a, a Toledo Mud Hens fan uh, was was something that I was sort of appreciated that made that character kind of quirky, right? Like he's always walking like who walks around with a Toledo Mud Hens cap uh, and, and jersey on. So those are two that I sort of was aware of because of popular culture. But right around that time that you're that you're talking about. The, the one that I became sort of aware of first, just seeing it and thinking that's kind of, that's kind of goofy. That's kind of fun. That's, you know, might be something you could put on a hat or a shirt and that I would wear around it was the Carolina Mudcats. And I remember, and it's funny that you're talking about catalogs, right? Cause they used to advertise in baseball America. They had like a full page ad in the back of baseball America, like the, the magazine, I think it was baseball America, but it was, it was one of those, you know, one of those magazines that you'd go to, Borders bookstore and flip through the, you know, the baseball, like it's all just like, it's like this, like really flimsy paper that they printed it on that looked like, you know, you could be wiping up a spill in your countertop with. And then, you know, it's all like just stats after stats after stats. And in the back is like a, a, just a picture of their logo and a picture of a cap that doesn't even have the logo on it. It's just like an illustration of a cap. And it's like, order, you know, order your mud, <laughs> order your mud cats hat. And, you know, and they were selling mud cats hats like that. And so that was the, uh, the, the paper version of, uh, of, of national hat day that you see on Twitter these days is, uh, you know, that, that mud cats ad in the back of, I want to say baseball America. I might have that wrong, but since you're the host and I'm the guest, I'm not going to fix it and post this time. Well, your memory serves because <laughs> it was indeed Baseball America. And the reason I know that is because talking about things you and I have in common, I saw those same ads. I subscribed to Baseball America back then, and I ordered myself a Carolina Mudcats <laughs> cap as well as a Greensboro Bats cap. And I That's remember going, going to the... <laughs> Going to, I, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and I remember going to the beach, wearing my, depending on the particular weekend, wearing a, either my my Mudcats cap or my my Greenboro Bats cap, and um, and actually thinking to myself, nobody else here has that cap right. because it, it's not like today where you can be in an airport, you can be at a at a at the mall, you can be at a minor league or major league game and you can see a number of of not just major league caps but minor league caps back then people not only didn't have the not wherewithal but ability to order those caps unless they saw that ad in the back of baseball america and there's a very um narrow audience of people who would see that ad um so it was it was truly kind of a one of the 
one of a kind thing on the, the beaches of, of Southern California back then. So, um, well, yeah, so again, things you and I have in common. So I'm gonna ask you now, it's kind of a, a, a rote question, but what are your three, not, doesn't have to be one, two, and three. Give me three of your favorite minor league baseball identities, non-studio Simon, because I don't want to make, I don't want you to feel like you've got to say, well, there's yours. And I know you've said nice things about things that I've designed. <laughs> so let's keep studio Simon identities out of that. Get, let, what are three of your favorite minor league ba baseball identities and why? So I'm not allowed to mention the Hillsborough Hops or the Daytona Tortugas or the Kannapolis Cannonballers. Is that what you're telling me? No, just keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you've all, and you know what? You've already mentioned them on this this interview right here. So you've done enough of that. Let's hear about some <laughs> other teams that, that you really like. So for those for those who are not, um, obviously, this is not a, a vi visual medium. Paul is wearing a Fort Wayne's Tin Caps dad hat, and he is wearing a Missoula Paddleheads T-shirt. Um, speaking of headwear, just so you know, uh, so your winter meetings Santa cap I, here. I, I have a 2007 baseball winter meetings Santa cap that I'm wearing because this is being recorded on Christmas Eve day. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully it will be dropping sooner rather than later. So yeah. as opposed to two months from now. So um, Merry Christmas, everybody. A belated happy Hanukkah and a happy New Year's in advance. All those things. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. This is this will be the last episode of 2022 for the Baseball by Design podcast. Okay, so hostile Dan Simon takeover. <laughs> in that uh, this final episode of of 2022, we are now going to hear three of Paul's favorite identities. <laughs> this is partly because I, you know, I just love the the stories of them, uh, and and I should I should point out too that this answer changes all the time. Like whenever I get asked, you know, the sort of what's your favorite, what's your favorite minor league baseball logo, it constantly changes. And I, you know, whenever I answer the question, I always go back and I think, oh, I forgot that one. One of the earliest ones that I would see out there in the world when I started, you know, enjoying minor league baseball logos was the Portland Sea Dogs. Uh, really love that uh, that guy Gilchrist creation. He's uh, he's not even really in sports branding, right? He's more of a, a sort of a character artist for like Disney and Fraggle Rock and and that sort of thing, but he's done a handful of of, of minor league baseball logos. Uh, Portland Sea Dogs is one of them. I really like that one very much. Uh, another one that I really like uh, outside the uh, the Dan Simon over here is the the Albuquerque Isotopes. I've always loved the Isotopes. I love. I mean, it's a great ballpark, but the story of of that nickname by virtue of you know just the 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 you know the connection to the simpsons episode and and the the story about you know albuquerque having connections to the science community anyway that's you know that's 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 a logo that i really enjoy the everett aqua Sox is an, is another one uh just again just the sort of the randomness of it right like that's that's one where there isn't really a great connection to the community it's just this sort of random groovy frog the the story that they tell of you know the, the the owners of the team actually getting these little these you know these Costa Rican red tree frogs or green tree frogs and I know that I'm getting that wrong if Ranger Amy were here she would be admonishing me for getting that wrong if um, only she were here if only Ranger Amy were available in some way um, and then uh, there was one other one that I was thinking that that I was oh yeah yeah, yeah. the um, the Hartford Yard Goats love i i the logo itself i enjoy more as much as i love the logo i love the story i love the connection to the the fact that yard goat is a railroad industry term that the the new york new haven hartford i forget the full name of the the railroad but the the, the railroad itself um being you know featuring prominently in uh in hartford connecticut the fact that they used the type uh, and that's a this is a brandios one, right? Like the fact that they used the type from the old railroad signage to to influence the type on the logo, that one's really fun. So the taking of the term yard goat, turning it on its head, and making a literal goat out of it is is a really fun story for me. 
One last one that I'll mention though that I really like just because it's totally adorable and it's sort of an interesting story is the uh, is the Salt Lake Bees. I really I really enjoy the Salt Lake Bees logo. Right, and well, that's a I think your most recently dropped podcast. So At the time uh, of this recording, that is the most recent episode. Yeah, and and your love for that was evident in in how you spoke about it with the with the people you were talking about on that podcast. And you know what? Kudos to Brandios on the. Um, Yard Goat's identity. I'm curious if this is coincidence or if this actually factored into their um, to them proposing that as a as a potential direction for their the, their new team name. Because right around that time, for some reason, goats were a really big thing. I met there were all of these videos on YouTube and on uh, on social media. Also. This thing, which to this day, I don't get goat yoga. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I've heard of it. I've heard of goat yoga, but uh, I've, I've never participated. I've seen pictures where these people are doing <laughs> yoga and there are these little goats like they're doing. Forgive me for not knowing the, the poses, the like the camel pose, not pose. Yoga enthusiasts, I apologize for being ignorant. I've never done yoga, but there'll be somebody on the floor on their mat in this position, your position, that's probably what it is, not a pose. And there's a goat standing on top of them. <laughs> this so, is a little bit like uh, on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, uh, when they bring in experts on one thing to talk about something else. The, the two of us trying to talk about yoga right now, I think must be <laughs> kind of comical to anyone who knows anything about yoga. Well, uh, yeah, I would say I would say <laughs> that's indeed the case. So, um, okay. Dan, Paul, before, you before you move on to the next question, there is one. there was one other logo that that I always 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 include in my list of of favorites that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is the the Brooklyn Cyclones Todd Radom's Brooklyn Cyclones logo based on the the roller coaster on Coney Island is is definitely a favorite and it, you you certainly named most of those that you have named with the exception of the yard goats which is a little more recent although mm -hmm. at this point 5 yeah. seven, eight years ago. So it may not, yeah. to me, that's recent because the <laughs> other ones you've named, Durham, Toledo, even the Everett Aqua Sox, mm -hmm. Portland Sea Dogs, uh, those are those are minor league baseball classics. They have stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about um, Mr. Gilchrist who, who did the, the Portland Sea Dogs identity, mm -hmm. not being a sports branding professional, which he wasn't. But that's because when that identity was done, over 20 years ago, and how many more than 20 years ago, I'm not certain, but I know it's over 20, sports branding was not the industry it's become. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but, but it has, the, the ones you have mentioned, with the exception of, of, of the, um, the yard goats, are, are ones that have, are, have stood the test of time, because they're good brand right. identity. Right. Uh, I can say, by the way, the Portland Sea Dogs, it was 1993. And the only reason that that sticks out in my head is because it was when Major League Baseball expanded uh, with the Marlins and the Rockies. The uh, they you know those two teams needed uh, minor league teams and the Portland Sea Dogs were one of the expansion double A teams for the for then the Florida Marlins. And so that's that's how I remember that it was 1993 that the, the Portland Sea Dogs came into existence. Well, there you go then, because I can tell you 1993, coincidentally, was when I worked on my first sports brand identity, which was the Fort Myers Miracle. And I can tell you with all certainty, there was no sports branding industry at that time. There was mm. one firm that I knew of, which is still around, called SME Branding. Oh, yeah. They, like, they were not doing minor league identities at that point. They later did do at least one, if not more. And that one that's coming to mind is the Augusta Green Jackets. Okay. Um, it was it was the one where, have, have you done an episode on the Augusta Green Jackets? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, well, if you do, you'll be talking about, in addition to where they currently stand, their, their original identity, which was done by SME. That was the one where they had the insect leaning up against the letter A, you might or might not remember that. I do. Then I did a brand update for them. And since then, Brandios has done an update of the one I did. So um, SME Branding did that one okay. over 20 years ago. All right. So 
Paul, you have um, you've been very vocal about your disdain for minor league teams who use their parent club nicknames. Uh, you have even gone so far as to say there should be a constitutional amendment <laughs> banning such such True. instances. So that's um, that's been clearly established. Are there any other rules that you would recommend for minor league that that there should be, if not a constitutional amendment, at least unwritten rules for written or or unwritten rules for for minor league baseball branding? So so don't name your team after your parent club is is definitely you know on the don't list, on the do list. The, the, the ones that feel like missed opportunities to me are the ones that have unique nicknames, but they have nothing to do with the community that they're in. If they were to be like a Wildcats or something, right? And I'm a Villanova Wildcats fan. So, you know, I feel like I feel like the the doo-doo is – I saw you smirk there when I said doo-doo, by the way. I think you, you, you were trying not to laugh. Uh, the, the, the major rule for me is, is connect to the local community and, uh, you know, ha- tell, tell a story the the you know the if it's you know the worst thing you could do is be named for your parent club but if the the second worst thing that you could do is have sort of a generic fierce animal that has nothing to do with with where you are and then you know and then sort of rule number two and you know this i mean this i should be asking you this question in terms of the design but uh, the, when I, whenever people ask me for feedback on logos, uh, you know, and they, and this is, I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm not very good at creating logos, but I love giving feedback on logos. Cause again, I, I know a good one when I see it, uh, the, the logos that get too complicated are the ones that disappear visually on a hat. So, so don't overcomplicate the logo. Don't be named for your parent club. Don't choose something generic. Do tell a story about your local community. So given that, do you what is a team or or what are some teams that you would consider most in the need of a of a brand update or even a complete rebrand? So these are these are teams that I think the, the logos are are fine. Um I think that maybe they were named at a time when like you say this new era of of they're not old enough necessarily to be classics but they were they were named at a time when these sort of generic names were a little bit more accepted and they haven't rebranded. So these are not like, you know, I'm not saying burn these to the ground, they're terrible, but I think that they're ones that I'd like to see revisit their their approach with something, you know, more more unique and more specific to to their 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 local community. Um and one of them is even a brand that I that I kind of that I kind of like, but I just you know it could be it could be anywhere in a gigantic country, which is the Vancouver Canadians, right? It's kind of a fun logo, but it's like the maple leaf and a baseball and the letter C. Uh, you know, Brandios did that one with the sort of running Mountie, who is almost a Mountie but not exactly a Mountie for trademark reasons. Um, you know, the, the Vancouver Canadians are one where, you know, there's so much about Vancouver. That's so cool that I, that I really think that they could, um, they could play on the, another one that, that I think of with this is like perfectly good logo. Uh, and this is one that I even joke when you, sometimes you'll tell me, you're like, I'm working on a a brand for a, a new brand for a team. And, and I always kind of hope that the one that you're talking about is the Sacramento river cats. Because like River Cat to me just feels so generic. And it's like, I remember doing a story about them on sportslogos.net because I was trying to cover the sort of bigger teams for the story behind the nickname series. And it was just like the Sacramento River goes through Sacramento. And then cats, they just sort of picked out of a hat. It could have been the River Cats. It could have been the River Dogs. Incidentally, by the way, the River Dogs, the Charleston River Dogs, don't fall into this uh, this trap. And this gets into something that I have learned writing about and doing a podcast about these names. One of the things I've learned is I'll I'll sometimes think that a name is generic and boring, and I'll call up the team and I'll say, hey, let's talk about it. And then there's a much more interesting story behind it than I think there's going to be. The Batavia muck dogs were that way, right? Like to to learn about the the soil. There's a very specific thing about the soil in Batavia, New York, right? The river dogs may or may not have been named for the rats, the giant rats that came in off the, the ships at the port in uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. So sometimes I'll, I'll think that a name is sort of generic and boring, and it turns out that there's a, there's a good story about it. And that's one of the things I love about doing this podcast and writing these articles. The River Cats is one where I called them up 
and and I said, hey, you know, tell me the story. And they're like, eh, it's not really a story. Um, and then the very last one, I have to say, it's it's a classic ballpark. It's a classic a, a parent affiliate relationship. It's one of my teams. The fighting fills, uh, I think, you know, could have, there's so much about Reading, Pennsylvania, you know, that they could have done some more fun things there than just be the fight and fills. And it's sort of, you know, that's sort of borders on the, you know, we're named for our parent club rule, but that's the, the fight and fills is definitely one that, uh, that especially since it's one of, one of my teams, I, you know, I would have put out there as, okay, could we do something, you know, could we do something a little bit more interesting? Uh, and then the, the only, the last thing I want to point out, perfectly good logo, classic logo, one that people totally love, the Lansing lug nuts, their lug nut logo is a bolt. It's not a lug nut. And uh, I, I've always found that curious and that the fact that people don't, you know, don't make more of a fuss about that. And very much the same way that the Winston Salem dash are named for not the dash between Winston and Salem, the hyphen between Winston and Salem. So they should really be the Winston Salem hyphen. <laughs> Well, you know, to your point about the the Valley Cats, there was a period before sprint, minor league sports branding in particular um, grew into what it currently is, uh, where attaching dogs or cats or bears to to <laughs> another word was kind of just something people did, like. The, the Mobile Bay Bears. That's like, what I thought of when you said would, that, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine there there are bears in, in or around Mobile, Alabama, but I don't know that they're really known for their bears. Right. I did an identity. I didn't name the team. The team came to me with the name, but the Tri-City Valley Cats. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I guarantee you there are cats, not just not <laughs> not just the house cats, but I would imagine they're, if they're in a valley, then there's there's hills and or mountains around them. And there, there could be, you know, mountain lions and lynx and bobcats mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or who knows what's there. I'm sure they're there, but I, that, I don't remember that being the reason why they named the team. I think they just, they, they were in a Valley and they attached the name cats to it. It was just yeah. something that was done back then. And I don't know, you know, if you did that today, I think that would constitute laziness. Right. Uh, for creative laziness right but back then i don't think they were being lazy i i it's simply a matter of people did not think about brand identities quite like they do now for the most part i'm sure you can go back and and there were well perfect example toledo mud hens that name goes back to you know pre-korean war i don't know the exact year it started but if it was in not if it was in mash so that takes place during the Korean War, which means the name Mud Hens started at likely predated the Korean War. Um, what a great name for a team. Even today, that's a great name for a team if somebody were to name that starting in 2022. So mm -hmm. there were examples of good team names. Why they were so clever back then, um, I couldn't tell you, but that certainly was the exception and not the rule. Yeah. Okay. W one of the things you and I talked about in in a one of the more recent podcasts uh the Fredericksburg Nationals podcast were was the fact that, that some of the things I learned mm -hmm. when when doing my research into uh, uh what I might do with regard to a particular brand identity and not just my research but the doing my due diligence and speaking with with um, people in the community, speaking with uh, uh, historical societies. You don't do this, but you dive into this with other people. So what are some of the things that stand out to you that, that you learned that were particularly interesting, unexpected, or surprising to, to you? You know, this is, I actually love this question. The, the very first story that I wrote, uh, that I started researching anyway, was on the Lehigh Valley iron pigs and learning that the iron pigs were named for the pig iron that they forged in the steel mills of Eastern Pennsylvania, right? Like it just gave such a, an a, a amazing sense of place, right? The, the, that understanding that the minor league, the minor league team was called the 
iron pigs because of the the steel mills there. And so I, I mentioned already the soil in Batavia, New York, right? Like the fact that there's like this super rich soil called muck that is perfect for agriculture in Batavia, New York. Learning about California, all of the agriculture-based names in, in California uh, is something that, you know, if you've not been to California, if you haven't driven through it, and I've done a lot of driving north and south on in, in California, so I sort of got to, to see it. But before I knew that place, like understanding that the the sort of inland empire of of California was just entirely agriculture, basically, was was a revelation for me. Some some other you know some other things the the uh, the Frederick Keys who are not around anymore at least in affiliated baseball, um, you know the the fact that Francis Scott Key was buried across the street from Frederick in Frederick Maryland from where the where the team plays. The Lakeland Flying Tigers being named for a a, a, a World War II, I think it was World War II uh, air battalion that trained on the place where that team plays. So they're a Tigers affiliate, but they actually trained uh, on in in the space where the baseball stadium is. And so that was sort of an, an amazing connection to me. The Charlotte Knights being named the Knights because they play in the Queen City, right? Like this, this, oh, this, this name that goes all the way back, almost to like, well, goes back to colonial times. Basically, was was incredible. The Columbia Fireflies are another story that I totally love, like being named for these synchronous fireflies that exist in three places in the world, and two of them are in the United States. Uh, that's an an incredible, incredible fact that that I learned. I am a person who shies away from the use of Native American branding in sports. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it should uh, be common. But the Spokane Indians have done it so well, right? Like they have incorporated the they they have worked with the local community. Their logo is based on artwork from someone with a local community. There's signage around the stadium that reflects, uh, you know, it's educational signage, interpretive signage around the stadium that that tells about the community there. They went to the community and said, uh, the Spokane Tribe of Indians, and they said, we're going to, you know, we're going to re be doing a rebrand. This was back in the 80s. We're doing a rebrand. Are you okay with being called the Indians, uh, with us being called the Indians? And they said, yeah. They said, you know, we, we really like it because of how you work with us. And so ever since then, they've been working with this team. Um, another one, the Binghamton Rumble Ponies being named for the carousel capital of the world, right? Like, what a great story that is. I never would have known there were there was a carousel capital of the world. And, you know, here you've got a place that's that's named for them. Uh, the Greensboro Grasshoppers being named. I never would have known there was a kind of a cannon inv invented by the British in the Revolutionary War uh, called the Grasshopper. I never would have known that. That was a really, uh, a really fun fact. The, what you've just done is you have in the, by the way, you've just gave many examples. <laughs> uh, but but what you've done is you've really driven home the fact that. What one of the things that makes your podcast so enjoyable is that with these baseball identities, you mentioned the Rumble Ponies or the Fireflies. There's two teams that have cool names, they have cool logos. So in and of themselves, they're enjoyable and can be enjoyed by other people who don't know these underlying facts. Right, but your podcast brings all of this to the surface. These are things that were considered by the designers and the teams and the other individuals involved in, in bringing these identities to life. And there's such great stories there. I know you've, you've talked about this being a way to talk about, you know, the, the history of the United States through these minor league team identities. And uh, they're, they're really such great stories and you've done such I'm sorry for kissing your you-know-what, but <laughs> you've done such a good job of of telling, through your podcast, telling these stories. When when you're not doing a, a podcast on a, a Studio Simon identity, I love listening to these other ones and hearing things that I never knew before. And I learn things and enjoy, and they're, they're enjoyable, fun things. So that's what your, your podcast is all about. Um, so there are so many animal names and we talk about attaching cats or dogs or bears or whatever else to, to names, but 
Uh, and certainly one should not name a team a certain animal or, or anything just because it sounds cool if, if there's really no connection to the city or the region. But with that in mind, is there an animal or frankly anything that you can't believe it has not yet been used for a minor league baseball team name. The um, the sort of short answer to that question is every time I try to think of of one, I find that it's that it, that it actually has been used. And so, like I thought of, uh, you know, I, I thought of the the like well, the first one's the manatees. I, obviously, they famously were the Brevard County manatees. Um, I thought of like a jellyfish, right? Like a jellyfish would be a cool logo, but then you've got the, the alternate identity, the, the Copa uh, brand for the Jersey shore blue claws is the Medusas. Right. And so they are, um, they, they are a jellyfish brand. And so, you know, I've sort of, uh, oh, and the platypus, another one was going to be the platypuses, but there's, there is a, uh, I think there is a, a platypus out there in the, that league, the sort of four team league that the Salem Kaiser volcanoes created uh, during um, during COVID. And so there's, there's, you know, number, there are a number of teams where I thought I was just like, there's the answer to this question. And, uh, and, and of course I was, I was wrong because there actually were. So I did, I did find one while I was looking around. Uh, and while we've, you know, we've had versions of this conversations, uh, this conversation previously, uh, the animal that I think would make a really amazing minor league baseball logo, if you could find a way to make it work, it's called a blue dragon it's a venomous sea slug that eats man of war and sounds pretty badass and looks kind of amazing. And the colors are kind of incredible. So uh, that's my answer to your question. The blue dragon. Yeah. I, I can tell you, I've got a list of, of names that I'm just waiting for the right opportunity to use. Yeah. Not just, not just random names, but ones that if the particular city in which a team I'm working with, um, plays that it could work i've got i've got a list also i've got a list of cutting room floor mm. names ones that i have i have proposed to teams with whom i was working on new new names for these teams mm -hmm. that they didn't choose like you mentioned the blue dragons that's the kind of thing that you i've uncovered in doing my research when you're trying to come up with a team name for a particular yeah uh, area city area region and there's some really cool things that i've come up with that the team didn't ultimately go with sometimes because there was another equally good name and sometimes because they actually made the wrong decision <laughs> but um there were some great names out there so and and that one right there was a very good one yeah uh, the, but just the the sort of flip side of that question is i think as we get sort of more and more outrageous with these nicknames and you know we're just trying to do just pure like shock value like how far are we from the blobfish or the naked mole rats or you know something just like as as you know like a monkfish right like what are the like the ugliest animals out there the sort of goofiest looking animals that we could you know make a logo out of because it'll have a certain amount of shock value well the Maybe. team that named themselves the platypus or the platypi uh that would kind of be an example of that Unless, I, unless you, you mentioned naked mole rats. Okay. I, I definitely went to a zoo where they had a naked mole rat at their, their zoo. And if a particular zoo, if a particular, if a city had a zoo in that was known for having a particular animal, perfect example, the DC zoo is famous for its pandas. So mm. pandas are not indigenous to Washington, DC. Right. But if you were to name a minor league ball club in Washington, DC, which isn't going to happen because of regulations um, that will not allow a team within 35 mile limit of a major of another team, major league or minor league, um, you're not going to have a team called the DC Pandas, but if you did, it would make sense. So right. if if that particular zoo that I know I saw a naked mole rat at, if the zoo was kind of known for that, or even if not, even if you can just make that connection, hey, we've got a great zoo here, and one of our popular exhibits is this naked mole rat exhibit. Um, that name could work there, but I wouldn't name a team the naked mole rats just to name them the naked mole rats. So this is the sort of thinking, though, where you can connect to a sort of wacky team, right? Like a, a wacky animal, like the Laredo lemurs did. You know, they, they, the Laredo lemurs 
are they're the lemurs obviously lemurs are native to madagascar but the laredo lemurs were called that because there was a an archaeological dig and they turned up these like three million year old fossils of animals that kind of looked like lemurs and so they're like we're going to call the team the lemurs because we did this dig and we found these animals that kind of looked like them so even if you have to make like a tenuous connection but you could do it like you know you could do like a gila monsters or um uh, um the komodo dragons or something right like if you could find a way to connect to a team like that you know with these sort of wacky names uh or these sort of cool animals that don't actually have a connection but you can find a connection i don't know there's there's something to be said there's a lot of really cool animals out there that have not been made into to logos you know giraffes there's no giraffes in minor league baseball <laughs> oh oh or is there Uh-oh. or is there now not minor league but collegiate summer league baseball doesn't the uh sky dylan um zookeepers identity have a giraffe in the primary there, logo? There, is, there is a giraffe in that primary logo but i but they're not called the giraffes right right but there is okay but yeah. okay hey paul you know what we've uh we've been having such great conversations here that this is i realize this is running on a bit so we're gonna pause here and we're gonna take a little break and come back uh next week for part two of this interview all right. Sounds great, Dan. This is this has been fun. I'll look forward to chatting with you more for part two next week.